um, this gal Jill with the maps is sort of exhibit A to me about God's amazing way of putting different talents together. You'll just really enjoy her. But I said to her, why did you ever pursue maps? Were your family in geography or did they travel a lot? She says, no. She says, from the time I was a little girl, I loved maps. I, I had wallpaper. I took maps and wallpapered my room with maps. And it's such an example to me of a gift of God in someone. And her ability with maps has helped so many of us be able to see where to spread the gospel, how to be involved with it. So these, these unusual gifts that God puts in people, they're all for his glory. Isn't that fun? So you will, you will really enjoy her. Uh, David has been speaking to us from Titus. We have very similar words that in, in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, I will just let you uh, stand and uh, read those out loud to somebody. Just read through chapter, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3. It's, there's a few other words there, but not many. It's all pretty well the same in Titus and Timothy, uh, again, on the character and conduct of a leader. And then we're going to talk about some of the practical ways that looks. So just read that out loud to one another or stand up, read it to yourself. I think you all must have had too much chocolate or you're not, you're sort of down on me here. Or too much weekend, maybe. And everybody said, amen. amen. You might remember when we first started our time together, we talked about sort of the combination of gifting between Lauren, David, and myself. And uh, you have been able to see how we work back and forth together. And I remember I, my particular role is kind of the so what. If it says this, how do we wake up in the morning and we do it? And so we will talk together now about some of those practical applications of the way leadership is played out. Now, first of all, it says that it's a good thing to desire to be an overseer. 
If you have a leadership gifting, it's a good thing to want to use that leadership. I think that Paul is just such a great example. You know, you can tell Paul really has a strong personality. We see where he has a little argument there about, is he going to go with Silas and Barnabas and all of those kinds of things that you read about in Acts? And you see he's got a strong personality. But I think we can see the gifting of a leader and a coach when you look at his relationship with Paul and Timothy. And he's, he really is so appreciative of the things a good leader should be appreciative of. He talks to Timothy and he, says to, he encourages Timothy all the time. He says, Timothy, just keep on moving on in leadership. He helps him know how to handle conflicts which of course is a big part of leadership. He taught, gives him practical things. Don't let them get, you know, you are young. That's really right. You are young. So because you're young, be more careful about your mouth, how quick you have an opinion. Learn to listen well. But at the same time, remember, the gift of God lies within you. And we don't see in Paul's leadership with Timothy that Timothy is a little Paul. <laughs> he doesn't say to Paul, to Timothy, you got to do it just like I do it. And I love this about Paul. He seems to be so overawed all the time that God should use him. Hey, I, I was just the worst of sinners. But the grace of God came upon me. And if you notice as you're reading instructions from Paul to Timothy, usually you read about 10 verses and then he says, but remember the grace of God. <laughs> remember the resurrected Jesus. <laughs> and I want to say that to you, friends. In all the weights of leadership that we take and the days that we don't know quite how to remember the grace of God, <laughs> Remember the resurrected Jesus, and he's constantly reminding him of that. It's also interesting to me that Paul reminds Timothy of his own family and, and his mother and his grandfather. So he honors the family relationship. He also says, remember the elders laid hands on you, and he honors other leaderships in his life. One of the things we have to be particularly careful of in our organization, and I think it's wherever you have a strong community, and you hear us talk a lot about having an apostolic learning community. And young people come to us from such brokenness. And many times, being within the context of caring people is the first strong family relationships they've ever had. And it's easy for them to look to us as their family and not remember where that they're connected to another family as well. One of the places where this really can show up for at least for us in our organization, and I think it's probably true for others, if, particularly if you're working with young people, is that, you know, um, Youth of the Mission is a really good place to meet your mate. And so young people come who have the same vision and the same values, and they are together. And Lauren always goes, says to them, you know, I'm the father of this organization, so I should probably get in dowry for all the people that have met in YWAM. <laughs> I laughed. One of the guys that was civic, uh, serving in Central Asia and was marrying a YWAM staff gal, who we, and we knew both of them well, we got this little box and in the box were three little camels. And it said, I'm paying my dowry. <laughs> <laughs> but young people, they come to us and they submit their relationships to us because we have a close, and when I say submit, they just bring us into that circle of information when they are, where we are not controlling their particular personal lives, but they want to include us, and that's always a joy. And we have a lot of amazing cross-cultural 
marriages that happen because they are with us in this setting and we so celebrate the nations. But we always have to be careful, friends, on this teaching and understanding of domains. We are close to them. These are so many times dearest young people who we have believed in for years. We've had a lot to do with them. We may have had a whole lot more to do with them than their mother and father or other family members who are maybe not believers. But they still belong to another family. <laughs> And we must never cross over that domain. And I'm always, particularly when it comes to marriages, but we just want to get married here. This is where our, great, our family is. And I say, yes, that's right. We want to help you do that. But what about your own parents? You're going to have those parents for, <laughs> for a long time. They'll be the grandparents. And let's be sure we include them. And, and particularly in our cross-cultural marriages, I encourage them to go to each other's culture because YWAM is a culture. <laughs> we, we, we so celebrate the nations, and it, uh, at all, it's all entirely different than going to his culture or to her culture. Are you with me? And we see that Paul was very careful not to get these domains mixed up. He didn't try to be just the family, though he loved Timothy like a son, and he's open about that. He still remembered that he had a mother and a father. Now, he talks about being uh, above reproach. Now, that means that you have a good reputation. You're transparent. You let people know more than maybe you need to. Lauren talked about that when he talked about it was important to let people know how we have the beautiful home that we have. Because most people live all their lives to try to acquire a beautiful home. <laughs> it's something that they want. Billy Graham was the illustration that he had. And friends, you, there's no need for us to cause people to stumble on any area. And I believe that it's very wise for a leader to be more transparent than what they need to be. And now, on the internet, you might as well make that decision right here and now. <laughs> because anything from anywhere, anytime can come to the forefront. Now, we've always encouraged leaders in order to have that open reputation that maybe you, when you were young, you smoked drugs and did pot or whatever. Maybe you were taken over by the police. Maybe you had uh, a little time in prison before you knew Jesus. And we have, through the years, always said to someone, be sure where you move in leadership, where you're going. If you're going someplace where they don't know anything of your background, find a trusted pastor. Try, find somebody in that area and say, I want someone here in this town to know who I really am. Because at some time, somewhere, this might come up, and I want you to know what I did was wrong, how I handled it. And you don't have to be putting that on the front page of the paper, but if it should come on the front page of the paper, you can say, yes, five years ago when I moved to this town, I went to see this respected pastor. I told him who I was, and I'm, I am w walking in as much transparency as I possibly can. Because on the Internet now, it is really awful what can be put forward. We, we, we are having to be more active in our communication than ever before, friends, to talk about ourselves <laughs> so that others don't talk about us. <laughs> and we get the news out before somebody makes up something. And uh, that's, we will have a, a, a session on one of the afternoon sessions, I believe it's this week, on uh, the whole thing with the Internet and the this particular time in the information era and how we think about that with communication. But in your heart, always be sure that you are a person above reproach. Don't, don't keep anything. You can eat, if people know if you're gonna pay your bills on time. <laughs> people talk and all of those things 
they affect your leadership. You want to value people in every single setting that you are in. And people need to know who you are. And you are above reproach when people know about you. Be more transparent than what is necessary. I don't mean to be talking about yourself all the time, but you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> that you have a circle of people that you really keep um, close connection with and that you, you are known and that your reputation is good. Talks about being a husband of one wife. So I want to talk a little bit about this husband and wife team in leadership. You always have a, a certain amount of teamwork depending on your gifts, how that works. And of course, I have been the wife of one husband, and he is the husband of one wife. And so I only have, uh, you know, the closest association is myself and Lauren working together. And you uh, on this team of being together, it's really quite, quite remarkable to be able to be that kind of team. And I believe that every husband and wife should be a team. It may look different in all kinds of different settings. But because we're talking about leadership, I just want to talk a little bit about husbands and wives in leadership together. Now, Lauren has uh, the, a, a strong leadership gift. No one would take, make doubt with that. And he is a leader. I have some leadership stuff too, and my style is very different than his. And we can work together really quite well because we understand each other's giftings. And what, what's really important, and maybe the easiest way to say this, is to understand which hat we are wearing and when we're wearing it. Let me give you an example. You see a policeman, and you see his hat, and you think, oh, he's a policeman. And he goes home, and he lives on a coffee farm. He takes off his policeman hat, or maybe he went home on a motorcycle, and he put the helmet on. Then he got home, he took off that hat, and he put on a straw hat because he's going out to work on his coffee farm. Later in that afternoon, he goes to coach his kids' soccer plays, and he's got another kind of hat on. And by looking at that hat, you kind of know what he's doing, right? So we have to decide, and we have to discern carefully, and this is also a domain issue, is what hat are you wearing when? So Lauren is chairing a meeting, and I am one of the team members on that meeting. Um, I am, let's say, I'm re representing at that time uh, one of the, the training department. Lauren's representing the whole campus and has pulled us all together, these different departments. In that moment, Lauren does not have his marriage hat on. I do not have my marriage hat on. So I cannot say to him when he's leading that meeting, oh, honey, that's a really bad idea. <laughs> he is not oh, honey at that time. And he cannot say to me as a leader there, I don't really, that, Dar, that's not really a good idea. I should be able, if we truly understand our domains and where our authority lies, I should be able to disagree with Lauren and not get in trouble when I get home. Because in that setting, I am not there as Lauren Cunningham's wife. We do not have the marriage hat on. We have the ministry hats on. And I have an equal place with the other ministry leaders who have the right to disagree with him. Are you with me? And when people don't get this right, friends, it makes everybody feel uncomfortable. They may not know what it is, but they feel uncomfortable about it. People have the freedom to come and, let me say this a different way. Lauren and I can share any information, and we do. 
But I figure if you come and talk to me about something that's personal and confidential, that you came to me to tell Darlene, you didn't come to tell Lauren's wife. You came to call to Darlene, the leader, with my leadership or ministry hat on. And you should have the confidence that I will, and I, I will not go running to Lauren <laughs> and tell him that. Because if you'd wanted to tell it to Lauren, you would have told Lauren. Are you with me? Now, some people will not agree with that, okay? The two are one. You should be able to share everything. And I feel I, I don't let somebody say to me, Darlene, I want to tell you something, but you can't tell Lauren. And I'll say, I have to have always that freedom, but I want, to, I want you to know I wouldn't do it without you giving me permission. But you need to know that if I say, because in this case, I would not be going to him as Lauren, my husband, I would be going to him as Lauren, the leader. Are you with me? And I, because Lauren's not here, I can say this, all right? <laughs> I always feel it's kind of a compliment to me if people come and say, you know, I'm really struggling with Lauren's leadership on this. <laughs> I say, yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> and, but no, I've, part of my job is translating the leader. But I don't go running to Lauren and say, hey, be careful, so-and-so's really upset with you. And they know that I won't do that. Are you with me? And I, I, it's just very important. Now, you can share confidences, of course. You have to have permission to do that. But you have to be open about that. And, and we want to be always the best help to one another. I remember one time Lauren came home from a leadership meeting, which I didn't happen to be a part of, and he was really upset by somebody. And he was telling me that, and he was venting about it, which actually he doesn't do very often. And I said, oh, that guy, he really shouldn't have said or done that. And Cunningham said to me, Dar, that's not what I need right now. <laughs> I already think that. And what he was doing, and I felt like in many ways I had put that marriage hat on, and he was looking for me to respond to him as a woman of God and help bring balance into what his emotions were feeling that way. And I, I didn't do that. I just kept the marriage hat on, and I, I wasn't trying to be that help to him. One of the things that's difficult for us uh, as we work in team together and as we love what we do, which in our case we really do, we love what we do, um, people always seem to be amazed that we could be so excited about our calling after being in it so long. And that's all kind of mystified me. <laughs> you know, I, I am absolutely convinced, guys, the best is yet to come. I'm, I'm serious. I, you have no idea the thrill I get every time I see all these young people gathered like this morning. And God, who are they? And are we giving them tools? And where in the world are they going to do? And how much more they'll do than we ever do? And there's just that joy in it. But we really do love our calling. And so what we have to be careful of is that we never take the ministry hat off to have the marriage hat. <laughs> we, we can work around the clock. <laughs> And never take any free time. Uh, never do. And we keep each other fired up all the time. <laughs> and so it's important to be able to take that ministry hat off and put that marriage hat on. And every relationship needs time to be nurtured for the relationship's sake. And you'll have to figure out how that best works for you. And so many times I have, when particularly in years past, when we lived on the campus and were very active in leadership here, um, Lauren would be away on a trip, and I would be the one that would be helping give oversight. I would pick him up at the plane with both my marriage and ministry hats on. But somewhere between the airport and the campus, Lauren would ask me, with my ministry hat on, how have things been going and is there anything I need to know right now? 
And then I, with my ministry hat friends on, have to be so careful that I give him the same kind of report, objective report, as I would to any other leader in this place. And he has to understand for me what's, what's urgent, what has to be taken care of. Now, we all have our own <laughs> various personalities and difficulties, and not always are we objective. But I try my very best. I really think about this before Lauren comes, because he has to, if I'm going to have my ministry hat on, he has to know he's, I'm going to have an objective report, not just out of my own stuff. And so once in a while, I will say to him, there's a difficulty happening in this situation, but I have to be truthful to you. You know, that particular person I kind of have a hard time with, so maybe my report isn't as objective as it should be. But he knows that he's not seeing it through, through a familiarity. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Because we're familiar with one another and we can, we can not use um, good judgment in that because it's gone through our own bias. Have I been clear on that? Does anybody need to clear that up? I'm not sure I made it clear. But which hat are you wearing really is very important in this ministry hat and the marriage hat. I think it's just, you know, the greatest thing you can ever do if you have that combination together. And you can so enjoy working together. You have so many of the same friends, the same goals. You can be iron sharpening iron. When Lauren and I get a few days off together, that's one of the things we just so enjoy, just in talking about God's world and what he's doing and the trends, in praying through various things. And so it's a partnership. But don't let that partnership be abused. And we also have to remember, friends, if uh, this is particularly happens in a husband-wife relationship. Some places, if the husband is the leader, everybody assumes that the wife has uh, some leadership ability and can put all kinds of responsibilities on her. That's particularly easy for us to do within our community settings. And, and she isn't Mrs. Leader unless she's got Mrs. Leader personal leadership <laughs> abilities any more than a man when he becomes a banker and his wife automatically knows about banking and so there has to be a freedom for the wife to walk in her ministry gifts and that be able to be able to know that she's walking in her gifting which may not be the same as somebody else's and those ministry gifts really need to be made very clear the Bible says that we're also to be temperate. Now, what is it, what is it to be temperate? Self-control is a part of it. But if we talk, yes, very much so. But if we talk about a temperate climate, it's kind of right in the middle, isn't it? It's not too cold and it's not too hot. I think that this is one of the enemy's great strategies to take good truth and always push it too far. So you become aware that there's, that they're really, that the enemy is active and that there's a place for rebuking the spirit and rebuking the enemy and spiritual warfare. And that's a reality. And then the enemy sees, oh, yeah, let's get them stirred up on that, you know, till they're seeing curly-haired demons and demons under the chairs and demons become everywhere, and that's the focus. And then what happens, people realize, oh, that's way out. We can't be, we can't be thinking like that. And what do they do? Go the absolute opposite. Well, I guess they're, you know, we're not going to talk about demons at all, and we're not going to get into the spiritual warfare because it's too extreme. And so as a leader, friends, the thing you must always be watching is that there is, there is a, t a, a temperate, a, 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 an approach that keeps things in balance. It's just, I, we see that so often. Remember some years ago when there was what now is called the faith movement. But when there was a real emphasis on a God that is generous. 
and that if you sow good seed and you give abundantly, God wants to give abundantly back to you. And there was some very good teaching amidst that. And then all of a sudden, it starts going too far. Oh, you know, do you, have, do you give to me, this preacher, and, and if you want to give a little offering, you'll get a Volkswagen. If you give a big offering, you'll get a BMW. And it all went way, way too far. Now, what happens? We don't want to talk about things like that. <laughs> So you begin to lose the whole principle of sowing good seed into good soil. And the whole thing that, that originally was the kernel of truth in that got blown all out of the way. And then now nobody wants to talk about that kind of faith. And there's some great truth there, friends. And in leadership, I believe you must be watching all of the time that you, that you keep things there, a good truth particular. Um, we are just in such this wonderful time of this great prayer movement that's happening about young people. And I feel like one of our great joys is seeing this prayer movement and the mission movement so come together. And that it's just, it's just so great. And because there's been some conflict in the past that I've seen where those that are, are the people that are committed to prayer, they say to the missionary who's overly active, you just do, you don't pray. And the, prayer, the missionary active person says to the prayer, well, you guys don't do anything, you just pray. <laughs> and one is, one is being uh, critical of the other. And what's the truth of it? We need both. We need both. So whatever you're leading, if you see anything moving to an excess, that in leadership is what you have to be, you have to bring the, <laughs> you know, a, a child seesaw or teeter-totter. <laughs> and, and you will see a reaction that often happens, and this is a, a delicate one in leadership. You have a visionary leader who always is one, an entrepreneurial spirit, that it's always a little bit chaotic around them. <laughs> I have real good experience on this one. Okay? The guidelines are always a little bit fuzzy <laughs> because they are always leaving space for new things to be born. And there's this apostolic gifting and this visionary gifting that just always is making everything move a little too fast for everybody to be comfortable with. And what can happen if you have an overdose on that, the people get worn out and they want something to get finished. They want something to get fully organized and the goals that were stated to be completed. And there begins to be a reaction to that and then there gets an overly management role because we're just worn out with all of this other. And what the truth of it is, is we need both. We need that visionary person that keeps pointing us out there, and we need the administrator and the people in operations and to management to make this gift work well so that the vision that is spoken out is organized and done. But both those groups of people can go too far. And it's that balance of those gifts together that's really wonderful. And that's keeping those, that right in the middle. And so as a leader, you don't want to ever be extreme. And you can bring your extremes by your influence into the leadership. And you want to be just right there in the middle. David talked a great deal about self-control. I think our son David was about 12 years old, and I remember this day quite clearly. We were living here in Building 3. We were having dinner, and he said to his father, what is the most important aspect for a leader? And I was surprised. Lauren quickly said self-control. And I believe that there are many reasons for this and all those things of temperance that was brought out by one of the tables over here that all of the things that were said that you're not to do was, could all have been under self-control. There's that category. But I think there's also the category of a leader's personality and gifting. 
most strong leaders have a strong personality. It's the way God wired them. <laughs> and that's part of the gift. So they have a strong personality. They usually should be strong in implicational think thinking. Most of the time, they can process information very quickly. And they, they come to conclusions very quickly in their mind. That's part of being a good leader. All of those aspects are there. So where you need as a leader but is to have self-control because we've been called to work in team. And even though you are so smart, even though you have processed it well, even though you understand implications, you still need the people around you. Because no one of us has all the gifts. And you may, with all of those strengths of gifting, you still need people that are going to help manage whatever it is that you're going to put out before them. You're going to need administrators and managers and people that do the operations and report back and take care of the details, all of those things you're going to need. And if you use the strength of your personality and your leadership gift and don't put that under control, how are others going to buy into the gift and have under understanding what you're talking about or where you would like them to go? I remember in one of the leadership teams that we worked on, we had one man that had a lot of wisdom, but he was one of the slowest processors I think I've ever known. So I learned very quickly as we were talking about things and as we were hearing one another's opinion that I would always wait until the very last to ask him for his opinion. <laughs> and sometimes we would almost just be getting ready to go out the door having changed the subject and that person would say, hey, by the way, I was thinking about... And he always had a different way of looking at things. And his opinion was well worth waiting for. So have self-control over your strength of personality. And when things are not going well, you can easily, in a leadership role, use that strength of personality when somebody else has a difference to you so that you don't have to discuss that negative side. You also, because you're a fast processor, you can be very good at arguing your point. And I felt like Werner sharing with us the other day was really so wise. He talked about the fact he won the argument with his leader. And he didn't win at all because he didn't value the relationship above being right. But one of the things you talked about here was humility. And part of it, as a leader who is strong in understanding, quick to see implications, has an ability to carry pressure, you can be at the place where you really would rather do it yourself and get it done than try to convince a few other people to do it with you. And I want to tell you that's short-sighted. Take time to bring your team in. Help people that are in the organization to understand the goals and why we do what we do. Bring them into your process. Take time. And in the long run, friends, it will be done so much better. We'll have a lecture at another time on the place of a leader in giving and receiving correction. But you know, relational breakdowns take up a lot of a leadership's time. It takes a lot of energy out of you, and it takes a lot of energy out of the people. And so why not do it right in the first place? <laughs> it, it, you really, you, you just take a little time. And be self-controlled. Uh, David mentioned about hospitality. 
this lover of diversity and be a leader being hospitable means you, you have such an open environment that you are truly approachable that sharing meals or whatever else you have with people is just natural I'll give you a little story on myself, which will probably lead to why we, at least in our mission, have made hospitality a strong value. This is many years ago. Lauren and I had been married for five years and by choice had not had children till that time. Then we had a couple of kids and that was my first time to ever have to stay home. I remember well the chalet in Switzerland and Lausanne there waving to the bus going out and I, and I was having to stay back and I wasn't extremely happy about that but that was what I needed to do and therefore I was the hospitality department at the chalet, the food services, the housekeeping, everything because everybody else had gone in outreach but our visitors didn't quit coming. Now, I grew up as a pastor's daughter. I'm going to have my mom come in and meet you here one of these days, who is 95 years old and full of the joy of the Lord. And so I grew up in a, a home of a pastor where they were very hospitable. My mother's British, so good manners were important to her and passed that on. So I knew about social protocol. And so on the outside, I did everything right. But there's a lovely forest right next door to the chalet. And one day, I was sick and tired of being hospitable. <laughs> and I walked out in that forest by myself and said it right out loud to the Lord. I am sick and tired of being hospitable. I don't want to smile any more smiles. I don't want to make any more beds. And I for sure don't want to show one more person the city of Lausanne. And one of those rhema words came to me, friends. And God said, I want you to go back and do a study from my word about the ministry of hospitality. I'm not talking about social protocol, but the ministry of hospitality. And I begin to see how Paul talked about the house of Stephanus, how they were addicted to the ministry of the saints, how Jesus had people with him and working with him who had the ministry of hospitality to care for him. That the word says, if you give a cup of cold water in my name, it will be not forgotten. And that ministry of hospitality is so, so important. I was also gratefully, gr greatly, sorry, and gratefully uh, influenced by the Sisters of Mary in Darmstadt, Germany. Some of you may be aware of Basilea Schlink and the ministry that they had there. It would be like a um, group of, um, in our way of saying it, would be like Protestant nuns who had devoted themselves to the Lord Jesus that came out of the Second World War time and their joy in serving Jesus. And we went to visit them. And they were so hospitable. Everything was done with such beauty. And the flowers and all of the little extra things were there. But they also anticipated our needs. And we have really tried within the mission to be able to teach on hospitality. We have whole seminars on hospitality. And if anybody's interested in it, I have a little booklet that I could also pass on to you on hospitality. But to be able to anticipate somebody's need, and we hope you have felt at least a little of that. We don't always do it perfectly. But what it says is that we value you. And as a, as a mission, we have tried to strengthen that and always have hospitality be available for anyone who needs that. And I could spend a lot of time, which I don't have, on telling you the way that hospitality has opened up the door for us. Now, one of the other things it says here is that you should be able to teach. Now, that doesn't mean that you always are a teacher as a leader. In my mind, that means that you know what you're talking about. 
you have a biblical basis for it, and somebody asks you about it, you can teach them why you do what you do. The other, one of the areas here says about having your family managed well. Now, depending on the area of leadership that you are, but many of us in leadership, we end up being very strong public figures. <laughs> it just comes with the territory. And therefore, your children are public figures as well. There isn't a way out of that. So I would like to encourage you to have your children be a part of the team and recognize that this is what, what their role is. I come to the door at your place, and uh, you meet me at the door, and I come in, and, and Johnny is there, and you say to Johnny, shake Mrs. Cunningham's hand. And Johnny goes, mm -hmm. and you put your fingernails into his shoulder and say, shake Mrs. Cunningham's hand. <laughs> and I want to say, you know, just let me through the door. Now, what had happened is that child was put under pressure in order to meet me properly because this person was a leader and they wanted their child to, to and anybody would want to have their child greet someone else properly. But I would like to encourage you, particularly those of you in public leadership and your children are a part of your team, start very young and by yourselves about teaching proper manners and protocol. Practice at home, pretend like there's guests, teach them how to be able to do that, teach them about conversation. I had one child that we couldn't find the off button, and the other one we couldn't find the on button. And so you had to be able to teach your children about conversation, and it's like passing a ball. And when somebody throws you something, you answer and you throw it back. And you give them the skills for meeting people and feeling comfortable there because they too are public figures. They didn't, they didn't ask for that, but if you, if you, under the pressure of the situation, try to teach your child how to respond in those, that's not preparing your team. And through the years, we uh, did this with our kids. And I remember when our children were teenagers, we were at a very large conference in Frankfurt, Germany. And we had to go to reception with all a bunch of leaders and that. Our kids would have been like about 15 and 17. And with our, re, uh, with our particular calling, we often have very nice accommodations in a hotel where Lauren's going to be speaking or I'm going to be sharing. And our children would get all of those perks that go with that. <laughs> And so I would always share to them with, that we get these honors, but also we have a responsibility to be a good guest. And they learned quite early how to share about the university and where we were and in Kona and all, and why we do our ministries appropriate to their age, because then we would be talking about conversation. So at this particular reception, our kids were the only teenagers there. So they, they walked around and helped and talked with people and did the social things that they should do. After they left, I had people lining up saying to me, how did you get two teenagers to do that? <laughs> oh, I said I didn't start when they were teenagers. <laughs> They're doing what they've done all their life. We've just tried to give them more information. I remember one time there was a political leader here in Kona that had come to visit him. And uh, from the state, and I ended up having, going for dinner with them, and whoever was supposed to go with me, what couldn't, and our kids again were teenagers, and I said, you guys, I don't want to go out with the dinner with this man by myself. I need you to come with me. And he had all kinds of questions about the university, and they understood a whole lot about what we were doing and why we would do it. And again, he came and got me, and he said, how did you do that? And what it was, was being aware that our children are part of the team. But give your children the skills that they need to be part of the team. Many people have asked me about uh, Lauren's extensive travel schedule and how do we handle that. And Lauren mentioned how God gave him guidelines about how long he could be gone. 
But friends, he never was an absentee father. He may have been gone, but he wasn't an absentee father. Are you with me? He did not abdicate that. And you must always, and he, Lauren shared with you examples, and we have so many of God standing with us and working with us so we could be together as a family. I remember one time a, a young girl who grew up in a ministry family, she told me, she said, you know, I have a real resentment towards the ministry. She said, my father was always involved in the ministry. And it was so unfair to us as young people. She said, do you know that he couldn't come to my own wedding reception? He had to leave because he had a ministry responsibility. And I said to her, I hate to be so blunt, but I have to say this. It wasn't the ministry that called your father away. He had some kind of need to do that kind of thing, but it wasn't the ministry. He was misunderstanding God's call in some way, but God never called him to have him be abdicating his responsibilities as a father. Was, they had some other kind of issue that had to be worked through. Are you with me? But God, it's already been mentioned, God is first, he is second, he is third, and he will never call you to abandon your children. We've talked about the hospitality, we've talked about self-control, just... Bring us a few to closure here. Talk about being able to teach, and that again is that you understand what you believe and why you believe it. It says that we're not violent. You're not quick-tempered. One of our leaders here got in a fight on this campus he was a young man, came from a culture where they handle a lot of things with their fists. And somebody spoke against his wife, and he handled it with his fist. Right out, just about where the Ark Park is. As soon as that happened, a lot of people saw it. As soon as that happened, he came to my door. He humbled himself, and he said... Darlene, I have just disqualified myself from leadership. I'll step down from the leadership team. And I'm saying, now let's not be too, hes too quick on all of this. He says, no. He said, I lost my temper, and there's no place for that lack of self-control. And so the Bible's quite clear on this, friends, that we cannot be people given to temper, but we must have self-control. It is 12 o'clock, so I will have self-control. <laughs> Isn't the Bible just so practical? And I need to say to you, we certainly have not been perfect leaders. <laughs> That's why we have so many things to share with you, because we've made so many mistakes, and God's been so faithful to teach us through them. And I, I, we see again, coming back to Paul, Paul was so aware that anything he ever did was but by the grace of God. And I want to say that to you. Any accomplishments, any success, it's only been by his great grace. And so we thank you, Lord, for the power of the cross. We thank you for your great grace. And we thank you, Lord, that you've given us instruction about our character and our conduct. But you've also given us power and authority to walk in righteousness and in holiness, not because of my determination, but because of the revelation of who Jesus Christ is. You've given us the precious Holy Spirit to whisper in our ears and say, this is the way, walk ye in it. You've given us power over the enemy. And so we just rejoice for the saving, sanctifying power of, the, of our precious Lord Jesus. Whatever of these points, Father, we need more revelation on, and we probably need it on all of them, but there might be one that you're just really underlining now. We pray, Lord, that you will just allow us to see your heart in these areas and be the kind of leaders that follow Jesus 
quick to admit when we don't do it right. And quick to share the, the glory that, or the honor that ever comes to our leader as a leader with others because we know we never did it by ourselves. And be quick to always give you all the praise and glory because you alone are worthy. And everybody said, amen. Amen. amen.